Hi, you're watching DNA Today, a multi-award winning genetics podcast where we explore everything to do with genetics from CRISPR to rare diseases to new research. We have won the Science in Medicine Podcast Award for many years now. We have hundreds of episodes, and we really hope you enjoy these conversations where we dive into so many genetic concepts. I'm Kira Deneen, a certified genetic counselor and your host. Hello, we are recording live from NBC Universal Stanford Studios. We are back in person in the studio, and I'm really excited. I've been looking forward to this interview for a while. I have Izzy Kornblau joining me um, all the way from New York City now. <laughs> close, Hi, hello, close train ride. Um, but Izzy is a cardiovascular genetic counselor, researcher, and YouTuber based in New York, as I said. So thank you so much for coming in the studio with me, Izzy. Thank you so much for having me, Kara, and thanks to NBC Studios as well. Yeah, so I have to congratulate you. You surpassed 43,000 subscribers on YouTube. I knew you had a following, but I didn't know it was that big. Thank <laughs> like, you. Yeah, it's, it's been about five years since I started my YouTube channel, and it's wow. crazy how large it's grown over yeah. time. Yeah. No, that's very fast growth. That's that's amazing. And, and they're very dynamic videos. You know, I kind of went down a rabbit hole of watching a bunch, and I was like, I have to go to bed. But <laughs> you're very engaging on it. Um, and it's really cool that you cover a lot of interesting topics, like we do here on DNA Today, um, but covering genetic topics, genetic counseling, and also about EDS. So I thought maybe you could give us a little bit of background on EDS and then we can kind of get into your own personal experience. Yeah, absolutely. So EDS stands for Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes and it's basically a collection of over 13 types of connective tissue disorders. Uh, the most common ones are the hypermobile type, the classical type, and the vascular type. Um, and the type that I tend to focus a lot on in my videos are, is the hypermobile type, which is also the most common kind or type of, uh, of the syndrome. Uh, so these conditions tend to come with symptoms like joint hypermobility, skin hyperextensibility, sometimes fragility as well. And then there's also you know, subtype specific symptoms. And so for hypermobile EDS, we see a lot of musculoskeletal pain, a lot of autonomic dysfunction, like dizziness, fainting, um, sometimes GI tract disturbances as well, um, including dysmotility. And there's several other symptoms that can come along with these conditions. One important thing to say is that some of them can actually be life-threatening. And even though all of these conditions do fall under one umbrella and one name, they really are distinct conditions. I think that's a very important note to make with that. And like as you're saying, it's all coming back to me of studying for boards <laughs> a couple of years ago. Um, but it is important that there are different types and they are very different types very different. in terms of symptoms. When I when I think of EDS, especially like before I went to grad school, um, and you know, really dive deep into all of this at the time. Um, hypermobility is like the first thing I think of, and that's probably what a lot of people think of with it. Um, so, with those types, is it how are they diagnosed? I guess is it based on symptoms? Is it the genetics? Like, I honestly don't know the answer to this. Maybe that's embarrassing. Maybe I should as a genetic counselor. <laughs> no, that's completely fine that you don't know, and I don't. I think that most people don't know this. So, twelve of those thirteen types have a known genetic marker and so we can perform genetic testing the one type that does not in most individuals is the hypermobile type of eds and so that solely relies on a clinical exam done by a physician some people a very small portion do have a, a known gene i think tnxb is really the only i guess associated gene but that's such a small number. Right now, though, there are certain studies that are going on trying to identify possible candidate genes. I'm currently working with uh, one of those studies ongoing, which is really exciting. Yeah, you were telling me a little bit about that before. So let's let's dive into that because sure. research is really cool in general. Like, duh, it's a genetics podcast. We're super into research and all the new information. <laughs> um, but from what I understand, there's a candidate gene that is being studied and you're part of doing that studying to see yeah. like okay is this are there changes in this gene that either cause the condition or make people predisposed that's kind of what i'm thinking so correct me explain how that how that all works definitely you're you're exactly on the right track okay so, okay <laughs> uh long story short to really make this more simple um 
the Medical University of South Carolina, MUSC, has a lab called the Norris Lab. They've been able to um, identify a family of candidate genes. Um, they currently have mice models that both uh, that they that actually have a specific variant that they've been looking at because they initially identified it in a very symptomatic HEDS family, and it perfectly segregated with the phenotype, and so that was really interesting. They they knocked it into mice with CRISPR-Cas9, and these mice really do present with the phenotype of HEDS. Uh, what's also really exciting is that they've been doing studies like looking at large cohorts of individuals who already have a diagnosis of HEDS and doing whole exome sequencing to see how many of them have rare variants in that family of candidate genes. Where more of my research comes in is from the genotype first approach. So I'm taking a look using Mount Sinai's biobank and later using the UK biobank to really look at individuals who have variants in this family mm -hmm. and then assess them for symptoms of HEDS. So there are two different approaches there. Like the first yeah. you talked about is, okay, this family that has the condition, the people that have the condition, they have the variant that they were looking at, like, ooh, does this cause EDS? And the people that don't have it in the family don't have the variant. So it made it fairly clear within that family, like, all right, this is pretty good evidence that this genetic change causes the condition. But then with your research, you're flipping it and saying, let's look at this variant and seeing, does it actually lead to EDS? Am it, I getting your part right? Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah, exactly. We're looking at individuals that we know have rare variants in this family. Now keep in mind, so many of those variants are not gonna end up being right. true pathogenic variants. So it's I'm, a needle in a haystack a little bit exactly. when it comes to looking at like, okay, what variants, especially once we get into rare variants. Exactly. Rare genetic spelling changes there. And it yeah. really kind of weakens the statistical analysis. Mm -hmm. However, what's super exciting is that even, even given that, we still saw several significant differences. And so from my side, I can say a couple of them. For example, we saw significantly increased rates of um, tear of the rotator cuff. Okay. We saw increased rates of gastroparesis, which is you know something we see a lot in patients who have diabetes, but it's also something that's quite common in HEDS. And so that that's, that's really interesting. Um, and one of the biggest findings from my biobank study is actually thoracic aortic dissection, not aneurysm, which is really interesting because usually dissection is actually not a symptom associated with HEDS. When we're talking about the aortic phenotype for somebody with HEDS, it's usually limited to just a small aortic root dilation. Okay. That doesn't and this progress. is all heart stuff you're talking about. Yeah. So yeah, all, all heart like stuff. changes in the heart and um, changes in the heart that can lead to really, really bad medical consequences. Exactly. From that. And we're, we don't usually see that in HEDS. So it's weird that we did see that. So we'll see what we can replicate using a larger biobank. And that's what we're doing right now. Okay. So there's multiple genes you're focused on one gene or, or multiple? I'm focused on every single gene within that family. Within the family, yeah. okay. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm, it's just, it's fascinating how quickly we can get information, especially now being able to use biobanks. Like, you know, I don't know when biobanks became more of a thing, but just being able to look at all that data and then have the phenotypic data with it to say, okay, yeah. this is, was the person's genetics, this is the symptoms they have let's figure this out because genetics is very complicated and it's it's not as straightforward as other say single gene disorders where it's it's very clear like cystic fibrosis sickle cell we say okay there's this change this leads to this phenotype yeah um you know although i say cystic fibrosis that one is a little more complicated, little more complicated. Than, than we than we learn in, in high school i think um but yeah no it's it's really interesting just to see and, and i think just as a patient advocate how cool is it to be able to be involved in research of a condition that you are personally affected by it's really exciting. Yeah. Like I, I can't tell you how how happy I am that I'm able to do this and how extra passionate I feel because it's something that affects me, but it also now affects my friends because some of my friends mm -hmm. also have EDS because, you know, once you kind of join the that patient community, it's mm -hmm. really nice to, to make friends who are dealing with some of the same things. And so I think it's really exciting because as a patient, I've really understood what some of the struggles are for the HEDS community because of a lack of you know, single genetic cause. And so to be able to genetically test individuals can really have such a huge impact on this condition. Yeah, I would think even just being able to have that genetic diagnosis instead of a clinical diagnosis of if you can do that for people where this condition is running in a family, then we can say, okay, well, now we can start doing preventative work or we're aware of this. So we can start treating symptoms, you know, as they come up and, and 
it probably depends on what area. I would think in the more cardio area, prevention is very key there. Especially for some of the other types. I think with HEDS, luckily, it tends to, to not be uh, – to, there, there tends to not be too much of a cardiac phenotype other than POTS and autonomic dysfunction. Um, but I still think that having that genetic diagnosis is, is extremely important for preventative things like physical therapy, for example, and understanding you know, which family members are at risk for certain types of dislocations or later on developing chronic pain, maybe avoiding certain activities depending on the specific person and what their physician wants. I know, for example, maybe as a kid, ballet was not the best for me, or gymnastics, mm-hmm. because I was told to keep, you know, pushing and going even harder and stretch that joint even further, and I could do it. Right. Um, so I did it. But should you have at that time? Exactly. Maybe not if we had that information. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and I I recall at least one of the types of EDS it can be very dangerous to be pregnant. I'm kind of thinking my, my prenatal genetic counselor mind. Am I remembering that right? Yeah. Okay. So what you're thinking of is exactly right. The vascular type of EDS can come with a lot of complications during pregnancy. Okay. Some other types as well. It's just my mind immediately goes to vascular because that's mm-hmm. one of the three most common types. Uh, what is interesting is that more recent studies have shown that severe complications are less common in vascular EDS than we once thought because mm-hmm. – people who are initially diagnosed earlier on are going to be those who have a more severe presentation of the EDS. So mm-hmm. luckily, you know, it seems like those risks are a bit lower, but but it really can be. And I, I'm curious, is this anything you've ever seen before in prenatal I counseling? have not personally known a patient that has shared that they have EDS or vascular EDS, as you're saying. Um, I'm sure if I'm in the field long enough, eventually, I'm yeah. sure I'll meet someone, um, but not that I can recall. Yeah, um, but I think maybe I just haven't seen enough patients yet, to be honest. Um, But you mentioned something a little earlier of that you have a lot of friends in the EDS community. And, you know, I want to give you a little bit of credit. You've really developed a community for people that have EDS through your YouTube channel and just sharing your own experience, but also sharing medical information and just being an educator out there that especially like now you are a genetic counselor, you know, welcome officially to the Thank field. You. You've been in it for a while. You know, one, one, once you get that match day information, you've matched to a program, it's like you're in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but how, how has that been just developing the community and like what have you personally experienced of the benefits of having people that you can just relate to and turn to and support you, support them? Like how has that impacted your life? It's impacted my life so much. I think I grew up having so many health issues and initially not recognizing that they were connected, but it certainly felt like I was the only person in my grade, the only person I knew that was constantly dealing with injuries, chronic pain, and other you know complications. And I was like, I guess I'm just accident prone, injury prone. And people are like, why are you always sitting out in PE? I'm like, I don't know. Um, And so it it was really exciting after I got my diagnosis to connect with somebody else who just got it. And we could just talk about it and really bond over it. And I felt so understood. What I think has changed now is while I still have that and I still have my group of friends that we talk about, you know, some of the, the struggles with our health. Oftentimes, our conversations have nothing to do with health. It's more just we can still bond over the fact that that probably was a little bit more difficult for you. I'm talking about, let's say, traveling, and it's just known that 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 was probably a really exhausting process, and we don't need to talk about it. We don't need to further dissect it. Mm -hmm. But they just get the underlying message there, and you guys can just, like, keep talking about it. And you're like, oh, you get me. I don't have to, like, explain a concept or, like, why this is happening or or why I feel like this today or, like, oh, you know, like, my energy's low today or this happened or that. Um, I think I've, I've heard that a lot from people you know, with a genetic condition in the community, rare diseases, yeah. with all that. And and I think it's great that you're able to not only share your experience, but also take it a step further and share with people and your subscribers of empowering them to navigate their own health mm-hmm. and advocate for their own health. Something that I've heard from people in the EDS community, from multiple people, is that healthcare providers, you know, didn't believe them with certain symptoms or they were not diagnosed fast enough, which is like how many times do we hear that yeah. in genetic conditions yeah. in general? Um, but but just that I seem to hear that more from the EDS community compared to other communities. Yeah, I do think it's unfortunately really, really common um, for those with HEDS to spend so long on that diagnostic odyssey and many people really <clears throat> never get diagnosed, unfortunately. 
I think there's so many reasons for that, and I could spend five hours talking about <laughs> yes, all those reasons yeah. and really could come up with them. But um, I think so, some of the main things that make it hard, maybe one of the main ones being that there is too much conflation between hypermobility and hypermobile EDS and the idea that this benign phenomenon or, or it's not always benign you know there there can be a slight increased risk for injuries and things like that is the same thing as HEDS when it's absolutely not um, and so I think because of that there's so much confusion by medical providers and by patients um, I also think that many individuals with HEDS are going to have their routine blood work come back normal. And so when they're presenting with certain symptoms, maybe they almost appear to be like an autoimmune disease or, or some other similar condition, but everything is negative. At a certain point, if a doctor can't think of anything else, it, they get dismissed or they get passed off from, from doctor to doctor um, or just called crazy and they're making this up as a psychosomatic. Um, and so I think that's a large portion of it. I also think something that maybe adds to the stigma of HEDS is that many patients are able to recognize the symptoms of HEDS in themselves before a physician is able to do that. Um, I know for me personally, just because I feel like I could speak for myself, I had so many health issues going on. I had my first subluxation at six and at mm -hmm. eight, I dislocated my, my patella. Um, at no point in the discussion when I was going to doctors for my stomach issues, for my joint pain, for my injuries, did I even mention dislocations? I didn't know they were connected. Like, why, why would I mention that? And so I think it can be really, uh, re really big like, enlightening for somebody when they hear of this condition and it kind of connects for them. Yes. And you don't see that a lot in medicine. Right. I feel like the doctor that diagnoses a genetic condition, that patient obviously is always going to remember them. But also for these types of conditions, like more rare genetic conditions, it usually takes a medical provider that goes out of their way to look through your whole chart, connect all the dots and say, let me come up with a list of conditions it could be. So like a differential diagnosis list and then kind of run through, okay, well, this one doesn't make sense. That one doesn't make sense. So but that takes a lot. If you just are coming into the ER for one of those problems, they're not going to think, oh, you have an underlying condition, especially sure. as a child. Yeah, no, of course not. You don't see a kid dislocate their knee and you're like, condition. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, okay, they did something weird on the soccer field or this or yeah. that gymnastics. Which is funny. Or, I literally, you know. like, yeah, yeah, took a step backwards. I did right. a back walk over and took, like, a couple steps and then that one step. Right. Yeah. One, one step. You like, that shouldn't it, right? lead to that, right? No. Yeah, but it, it takes a lot of you know, digging in and looking yeah. at all the clues to figure out, okay, could it be this? And especially for conditions like the the type you said that like you can't do genetic testing. Like it's yeah. we're only diagnosing based on symptoms. Exactly. Like yeah. that's really tough because then if you're just coming up with these random symptoms over time, it makes sense that people are taking a long time to finally get that correct diagnosis and maybe going through some diagnoses along the way that are incorrect. Absolutely. And I also think one other thing to mention, potentially why this condition can be overlooked, is that it was initially considered really rare. And somebody once in a textbook, I don't remember who, was like, one in 5,000 seems about right. There was, it was based on no evidence, based mm -hmm. on nothing. Um, and unfortunately, that statistic has stuck for <sighs> the hypermobile type of EDS. So that's a myth. We're myth busting right now. We're myth busting right now. Okay. HEDS is more common than one in 5,000. We don't know exactly how common, unfortunately. More accurate estimates are probably closer to one in 500. Wow, that's a huge difference. Huge difference, and it's probably even a little bit more common than that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, something else that I was thinking about of just your experience of, you know, just having these symptoms and going through the diagnostic odyssey and developing relationships through the EDS community, how has all of this inspired you to become a genetic counselor like, what, what was the timeline like in terms of, like, your diagnosis and then, like, wanting to become a genetic counselor, starting grad school? Like, because I didn't know you back then, so I honestly <laughs> don't know the answer to this. Sure. Okay, so I was diagnosed in 2017 with HEDS, um, but it had been maybe eight years of a diagnostic odyssey, and I feel very lucky. My doctors believed me, but it was a lot of, like, I don't know what this is. I'm sending you to that doctor, this doctor, that doctor. Um, so I had my own experiences and difficulties in the healthcare system. But after I was diagnosed, I became really intrigued by the condition and by, you know, medicine in general. I hadn't really had that much interest in it before. 
And when I started my YouTube channel, I started connecting with so many people who had had a similar experience or a different experience that thankfully I did not have to go through. But I started recognizing these gaps in healthcare and some of the difficulties that individuals go through when looking for a diagnosis like HEDS or something else. So it made me really aware of um, where uh, what needed work. What's interesting is that somebody in my family had genetic counseling for something completely different. Oh. Well, fun fact, I actually had seen a genetic counselor, but didn't like realize what they were. Um, <laughs> so, so looking back, you're like, oh, I like, met one. I, like, yeah. Actually, I met two. two? I think, wow. I'm assuming one must have been a student, now maybe, that I know. Maybe, yeah. Um, now that you know how it works and you've been through it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, which is funny because I do remember really liking them and thinking they were very nice. Well, so, that fits for genetic counselors, right? We're not biased at all. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, but... I, so a family member had genetic counseling and they called me and they said, I'm going to say that again, and they called me and they said, Izzy, I had genetic counseling and the entire time I could just picture you doing it. And this is exactly what you're passionate about. The, this oh. this genetic counselor was, was talking me through everything. They answered all of my questions. They referred me to somebody else. It, it was beyond helpful for them. I looked into it and there went my environmental earth sciences degree. <laughs> um, so anyway, but talking about how this has helped me, I think I, I'm so aware of, of what some of these challenges are and what makes a doctor's appointment good, what makes it bad. Um, these are my experiences, but these are also from hearing from other individuals as well. Yeah, it compounds. It's not just your own yeah. experience. That's probably the primary source that you're pulling from in terms of like as you're a genetic counselor now. But yeah, also just hearing from people. And I think it's helpful to hear like – what went wrong with people and saying like okay how can I not do that for my future patients mm -hmm. and reminding yourself because sometimes it's like you know I'm, I'm three years into working in, in a clinic setting and you do have to remind yourself like okay this is someone sitting down for the first time probably with a genetic counselor mm -hmm. and like I'm going through their family history like for us it's an everyday it's a nine to five right but for them it's like this could be a really major day for them that they're going to look back on and you know depending on the situation like when I see a low risk pregnancy, eh, well, they remember it probably not. But, you know, in your case, with cardiovascular, like, yeah, I would think a lot of people are going to remember those appointments. And I think it kind of grounds us a little bit to like remind ourselves of that. Uh, maybe you're not feeling that yet of being kind of early on and stuff, but, um, you know, check back with me in a couple of years. So, sure. But, but I, yeah. I understand exactly what you're saying. And I, th I think I, I can really look at the patient as a person because I can always refer back to things that, you know, I, I heard others say before I ever was a medical or health professional. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and while I have you sitting here as a cardiovascular genetic counselor, can you think off the top of your head of like some red flags that if people have a family history of this outside of EDS for a moment, sure. of what we should be looking for in terms of like a hereditary, I was about to say cancer syndrome because that rolls <laughs> off the tongue, um, a hereditary syndrome where there is a cardiac condition like behind that like FH or different conditions like that yeah um you know I'm just thinking you're sitting here and you're an Might expert well. in cardio right so oh, I, I'm so new <laughs> I, you definitely cannot call me an expert yet but maybe uh, I, one day expert compared to me how's that <laughs> amazing um some things that that we tend to see in clinic and that I would be on the lookout for is anybody with a close family history of a sudden cardiac arrest especially at a particularly young age where the cause was not known Sometimes we see that occur when somebody actually drowns and their death is considered due to drowning. Um, but that person was a really good swimmer and there was no reason for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, some other things are individuals with really, really high cholesterol um, and it's really not uh, affected by their diet. Uh, and some other things to look for also are individuals who have a family history or personal history of a thoracic aortic dissection or aneurysm. Thoracic meaning that's the upper part of the aorta, but also any kind of, you know, aortic aneurysm should definitely be mentioned to a physician if you have that close family history of it. Okay. I think that's really good advice to have there and, and for people to know because I think people have more of a, um, maybe not innate, but they have more of a feeling of, oh, this seems to be like a cancer running in a family, like so many people affected. Mm -hmm. But with cardiovascular conditions, it's not necessarily like, and hopefully we're not seeing multiple people affected before we're coming in to see a healthcare provider. So having one person in the family, hopefully 
it, someone's watching this that they're like or listening that they're like oh i should go see a cardiovascular you know genetic counselor geneticist you know uh whatever they have access to that yeah that's really helpful absolutely one is enough in many of these cases yes yeah definitely um, well, thank you so much. I am just, this was really cool just to dive into EDS with all of your personal and professional experience um, and just a fellow genetic counselor, obviously. I love interviewing genetic counselors. Um, what can we look forward to on your YouTube channel? Like any content to tease or um, favorite videos that you have that we can link to in the show notes? Sure. A couple things that you can look out for. So I just graduated um, and just began working, but I have a backlog of all of my rotations. And so Yes, we <laughs> talked about that. I don't know if that was going to be public information, but uh, maybe we're breaking the news right breaking now. Breaking the news right now. I love it. So I think that's especially helpful for individuals who are thinking about pursuing genetic counseling or who are currently in genetic counseling programs, because I'm really going to go through some of the important information in all of those rotations and then my impressions of them. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, that's fantastic because there aren't as many and maybe we should do more on the show of like case examples or like what what is it like to actually be in clinic and seeing a patient from you're looking through their medical history to like meeting with them and pre or prepping before that like all the steps that uh -huh. we go through um so that that's awesome i'm really looking forward to that and everything um so thank you so much izzy this has been a blast thanks so much kira Thanks for watching DNA Today. To access all of our episodes, head over to dnatoday.com. We also have a lot of bonus content on there that you can enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, guest pitches, you name it, send them in to info at dnatoday.com. We'd also really appreciate if you could take a moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. It really helps more nerds like yourself find the show. Also, if you like giveaways and other ways to connect with us, I recommend following us on social. We're at DNA Today Podcast. We also have a Patreon if you want to be the most level involved in the show. That's also at DNA Today Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Join us next time to learn discover new advances in the world of genetics.